Hi, today's demo is going to cover how to shape space with color using all four aspects of color. We're going to be working from this photograph, which you'll find below. First, I want you to mix colors. The colors need to have three values of each color. Remember to identify the color from the thumbnail that you prepare the ahead of time. Is faster. The panel that I'm going to work so, from is attached to foam core, and I'm going to apply yellow ochre paint to it. In this case, I'm using core. acrylic to tone the ground towel, so that it will dry more quickly. I've used a paper towel, and I'm dipping it down acrylic. into the acrylic medium, paint, and then applying it, it with very loose, large strokes in a very thin, really thin like manner, so it becomes very transparent and very light. This is also the way you tone a panel here. with a, uh, oil paint. So about, keep in mind, um, it's the same thing, whether you're using marks, acrylics or the oils to tone show. the panel or the okay. canvas, okay. that you want to apply it with a paper towel it and you want to do it very, very okay. thinly to spread it out. This is how you do it without any solvents at all so that you don't have any of those nasty fumes floating around the studio. So just grab a paper towel and dip it into the paint. And by the time that you finish mixing the colors on your palette, that panel is going to be ready to go. So you see how short a time paint. it takes to apply that under paint. It gives you a more middle value <laughs> ground to work <laughs> on. It's just a great way is to get a Callie? painting started. No, Warm buckle? Not. So after mixing your paint, remember you want to have three values of each color. Lighten with a equally intense lighter color. Darken with an equally intense darker color. After you prepare the panel and mix your paints, then we're going to start blocking in the no tan. I'm using a very dark purpley green that I've mixed to make the dark areas for the no tan. And I'm applying it extremely thinly with the big knife. So use either the big knife or the biggest brush and put that paint on super, super thinly so that you can almost see that toned ground through the paint. It's really easy to adjust that paint as you're applying it. So don't worry too much if you go outside, you know, so to speak, outside the lines. Because you can go back in and if you get somewhere you don't want it to be, you can wipe it off with a paper towel. You can adjust the shape very easily by scraping back if you need to. So even if you're planning on primarily working with a brush, having that smaller knife out and available not just to mix your paint, but also to scrape back when you need to. Uh, remember that removing paint is just as important as applying paint. So if you need to, scrape some off and put it back on again. But don't be afraid of making a mark. So right now I'm establishing the dark darks of that distant tree line that sits right on the horizon. And they're actually not all in the same space. The center trees and the masses on the outer edges are actually closer to you than these sort of punctuated areas that are in between. But right now they're going on all at the same time because it's part of that no tan. And then we're going to start working on the shadows, the no tan part that is in the foreground on the edge of the ditch that, that's right there sitting on the edge of the field. And before I start that, I'm just lightly, lightly um, letting some of the paint that's on the edge of the knife kind of draw that perspective line, that diagonal line that's right there at the front of the field, 
that helps to give a, a sort of sense of space through linear perspective. It's not real hard linear perspective, but there is a little bit of linear perspective in there. So by marking it off like that before I start establishing where the darks are in that foreground area, it makes it really easy to figure out where they're supposed to go. So marking it off helps to give me some guidelines for where I'm going to put those darks. And again, I'm applying those super, super thinly. It's very dark paint, but it's also very thin paint as well. So I'm using those dark areas. I'm actually exaggerating the darks just a little bit. But those dark areas on the edge of the field to help anchor that to the space that it's in. So having those darks all the way down that diagonal helps to really make that field sit down on the ground. Remember, there's no hard, fast rule that it goes dark to light as you go towards the back. It can be light to dark. The rule that we're looking at instead is that we have high contrast in the foreground, lower contrast in the background. So the strongest contrast is going to be here in the foreground, and it's actually going to be between the edge of the um, ditch and the field itself. There's a real strong contrast there. You have a wide range of values, wide range of textures and of hues in the final painting, primarily because I have juxtaposed those right where the ditch meets the edge of the field. As you move into the background, there are just not as many values. So after I've laid in that no tan, then I'm going to work in the sky very quickly, starting with the cooler blue, I mean the ultramarine blue the, towards the top. I've got four different blues mixed up, one that's just ultramarine blue and white, one that's ultramarine and thalo blue and white, one that's thalo blue and white by itself, and one that has a tiny little bit of thalo and a little bit of Indian yellow. That gives me a range of warm to cool um, blues, which also helps to create that same sense of depth in the sky that you're going to have on the land. And you'll notice that in the sky, it goes from warm to a cooler color in the background, just like it does on the land. So you have the same sort of reversals, or the same sort of rather, um, gradual diminishing in the sky that you have on the land. If you paint it flat blue all the way across, you're abstracting it and flattening the space. And that might be what you want to do. But if you're trying to capture that sense of depth, then you want to have more variations than just one single blue. So make sure you have almost as many variations in the sky, if not the same, as you do in the land. So here I'm laying in that second blue, not worrying too much about where they blend and where they meet, because after I bro uh, block that in, I'm going to come back and adjust and blend to the desired degree. And sometimes when working on clouds like that, I'll let some of that blending process determine um, how much of it is going to end up looking like cloud and how much is going to end up looking like sky. So some of that's happy accident. The next row, because it does look like rows, doesn't it? The next row is the very, very light phthalo blue and white. So that's going on right underneath the part that is half phthalo and half ultramarine mixed with white. And that's going down almost to meet the tree line, very, very close to the edge of the tree line. So it's getting right up on it. Once I get that blocked in down towards the tree line, then I'm going to flip the painting upside down. And I'm going to use the knife and that lightest blue that I've mixed to go into the edge where they meet and kind of play back and forth between the light and the dark so that that edge where the trees meet the sky looks a little bit realistic. Also notice that I am wiping that knife off almost after every stroke. Now here you see me turning it upside down and I'm applying some of that lighter blue up into the edge 
of the tree line. Don't worry about it too much if you pick up a little purple or whatever the underlying color is that you've used. You can always wipe the knife. You can actually go back and scrape it off if it's gotten into your sky color. So it's very easy to adjust it, uh, whether you're working with a knife or the brush. If you're working with the brush and it gets a little bit too blended there, just pull the knife out and scrape some of that back and reapply the color that you need to. So just go slowly and apply that lightest color where it meets the darkest color so that you have that top part of the painting established. So there you can see how little blending I've done so far. Once I've gotten that worked in, then I'll go back and I'll adjust. Get rid of any extraneous remar extraneous remarks, any extraneous marks, and um, adjust the blending so that it's not such a hard line or hard edge between those values, between those different blues. And again, watch because I'm going to leave some of that sort of featheriness between the values in there. Um, so that it implies more cloud than was actually in the sky that day that I took the photograph. Remember, you do not have to be tied to the photograph that you're looking at. It can be um, a variation off of that photograph. You're the artist. You get to edit. You get to control. So if you get an effect that's sort of a happy accident as you're working and you want to keep it, don't feel like you're so tied to the photograph that you can't leave it. Again, wipe that knife as you're blending to make sure that you're going to be able to keep the paint as pure as you want in those areas that you want to keep it clean. So that's guys almost done. Then the next area that I'm going to work in is that area of the field that is between the tree line and the ditch. So I'm going to take some of the slightly neutralized pink that I created. So I mixed some of the naphthol red with white added a little bit of yellow-green to it to tone down the, the pink in there. Remember those are complements so that tones it down a little bit. And I'm going to blot that color in as the base color of that field where the light's hitting it. I'm exaggerating the light that I saw in the photograph. So I'm going to exaggerate the contrast in temperature and in intensity in that area of the painting. So the only place that I'm being super careful about how I apply the paint is right where that field meets the tree line. I'm also working on not making that a hard edge between the field and the ditch. So I'm bringing some of that toned down pink down into the ditch to serve as an underlying lighter color so that it will help visually tie the field and the ditch together. Even though not much of that underlying color is going to show through on the ditch part. Again, wipe that knife in between so that you don't end up with horrible, messy mud. Okay. 
as I'm painting, some of that purple is going to mix in with the pink. That's okay. In fact, you kind of want some of that to happen so that it's not a hard, harsh edge between the darks and the lighter values. So don't be concerned when that happens. And also remember, there are going to be other colors that go on top of that. So if it's blended a little more than you want, don't worry about that. You can paint on top of that, and that, that blended part's not going to show. If it concerns you a great deal and it's in an area you don't want it to be, you can always go in with that flat edge knife and scoop some of it back out, scrape some of it off so it's not there permanently. So there right now, basically the whole panel is covered with paint. So right there we have the first initial block in complete. It's extremely abstracted at this point and not at a spot where I would leave it. Some might. But at this point, now that I've blocked that in, then I can go back and I can break those shapes up some. I can add a variety of other colors and temperatures and intensities to the field to break that space up a little bit more. So I have a warmer, um, more intense color that I'm laying in on top of the duller pink. And I'm going to use that to establish something that looks roughly like rows in the fields. And I'm letting the texture of the paint remain as I apply it. When you're holding the knife, make sure you're holding it almost flat so that you don't gouge into the paint that's underneath. Because at this point, you're starting to lay thick paint on top of thicker paint. It's not super thick, so I don't want you to think of super thick creamy icing. But it is a layer of paint on top of another layer of paint. Then I have gotten a medium valued warm green and I am applying that to the area that is more of a medium value towards the foreground in the ditch area. So that's the area that surrounds the dark that I put in to begin with. That green is being toned down a little bit by the pink that's underneath it. And I used the, the laying in there to mix several values almost at once. So that mixing is not an, an unintentional thing. I, I meant to do it so that the colors kind of speak to each other. One of the things that you want to make sure you're doing in a painting is have those colors relate. You don't want it to look like you, you know, filled it like we did as kids. You know, you would outline the shape in the coloring book and then fill it in. Uh, you don't want to do that in a painting. It'll look odd. So by letting some of that mix, it helps to make that foreground area speak to the middle ground area so that it has something in common. And it's not going to stay that dull. I will go back in with more greens and build up a more intense green on top of it. But it means that there's a slightly duller green that is underlying those more intense colors that helps to provide that bridge from foreground to middle ground. So one of the things I decide as I go along is how much of those darks are still going to show in the final painting. So I'm also trying to hold the knife in such a way as to make marks that I want to leave on the painting as well. So holding it sideways, holding it upside down, right side up, each one of those is going to give you a different mark. And you'll notice I put the mark on and then at times I'll go back and I'll blend it a little bit. And then I'll put some more paint on and pull it up to break up that hard edge at the top. If it goes up too far into the field, again, very easy to pull some of that out.
We're going to break up all of those spaces a little bit more in just a minute. I have several lighter greens that are also increasingly warm, um, as well as several other sort of neutral greeny pinks that go into the field area as well. One of the reasons that I picked this image was that there are not that many different planes in here. As you're looking at that foreground, you can see too, the, the, think of them as a box, the top that is being hit by sunlight, the side that is being blocked and not receiving any sunlight. So where that shadow is, it's just like the side that you saw of that red box that I made in the concept video. It's just this is the green box. Think of it as a green box. Different sections of green boxes that are juxtaposed up against each other to make what feels like a solid area of grass, as if grass is ever solid. But you know what I mean. So I've got several other colors that I'm going to be working with there as well. I have a neutral, more bluish purple color that I'm going to use to create another plane in the middle of the field area. There is a dip in the upper left of the field where there's a road that goes back towards that tree line. It's only visible for a part of the way across the field. So I'm going to lay it in with a sort of purpley lavender color in just a minute. And you'll see me using the large knife when I do that. And that lavender color is going to also echo some of the purples that are in the shadows and in, that will be laid into those distant trees. So you want to have a contrast there between warm and cool in order for it to read as a change of plane. Remember that when planes intersect, you have a shift in value, intensity, and in temperature. So there you see that lavender, bluish lavender color going on that's indicating a shift in the angle of the light. So the light's striking it but it's the side or a lower section that's in a little bit of shadow. So I've applied it and then I'm going back in and here's a highly technical term, I mess in that line some. So I'm going back over it a little bit to soften the edges and to blend it just a little bit so that it really does read as if it's further back into space because remember that edges get softer as you go back into space. So if I leave it hard, it's not going to read spatially in a correct way. So we kind of soften it up a little bit so that it reads as being further back into the space. I also mixed a second um, sort of purpley lavender color that we're going to apply on top of that in just a minute that um, will make that push even further back into the space. So here I'm beginning to lay in where the lightest light on the field is. It's not necessarily the lightest value that I'm going to apply there, but it's that light, super light area where there's a streak of light going across the field. So I've taken a more intense color then is used as the base block in and I'm blocking that color onto the painting. Then working it loosely into areas of that the rest of that middle ground so that there's a transition between the front part of the field and the back part of the field. So here you can see how thick that paint is where I applied the lighter edges. 
it's not going to stay that way. It's going to be worked in and blended just a little bit. As you can see, I'm starting to do here. I'm also working some lighter yellow into it. So I have a, a, a light yellow that I mixed. Not super light. It's still very intense. I added white to Indian yellow to push it to just that point where it's still intense so that I could use that to develop the area where the lightest light is moving across the field. So that's what you see me putting on right now. So that lightest light is being established. Then I'm going to go back in and break all of those areas up some more. So you're seeing the basic block in with the second stage of paint applied. So I have gone into that foreground and broken up the ditch area with a green on top of the pink that was the initial block in so that you've got a variety of values there. Then I have broken up that field with um, several different values of the and intensities of the pink, the slightly toned down pink. And, sorry about that glare there. Um, almost impossible not to have a little bit of glare when you're working on an oil painting. And I do tend to pick them up as I'm working in order to be able to maximize the angle that I'm, I'm working on. So even if I'm working on a canvas, I'm going to pick it up and turn it when I need to so that I can get the appropriate angle. So at this point, I'm now going back into the trees. And I'm going to break up those really dark darks that I've used there. And you see me putting in the middle value green that is going onto the trees in the back. So I'm pulling those main three main areas of trees that I talked about forward just a little bit by having some warmer color on them. I can apply that in a mass, you know, large single massive stroke, and then go back and break it up with a smaller tool and that'll pull some of the darks back out. Then I'm going to go into those two areas that I just indicated and I'm going to apply some lighter paint. It is a lighter green that is also cooler. It's a more blue green and on top of that blue green then I'm going to put a little bit of that same uh, lavender bluish lavender color. So here you see the blue green going in. That is the shadow color for the background. Where there just really are not that many different values. I'm using the small knife to do that. And here's the final painting. You can see those blue gray lines with the exact same color echoing it in the background.